Um, our next presentation is life in Lechuguilla, microscopic to macroscopic, intraterrestrial to extraterrestrial. Diana Northrup is with the University of New Mexico, um, understanding how life exists in the dark subterranean biosphere of caves has fueled Diana's passion for science for decades. In caves throughout the world, she studies extremophiles, including microbes that eat rock and microbes that masquerade as minerals to help better detect life on extraterrestrial bodies. For her PhD research, she studied microbes inhabiting ferromanganese deposits, also known as gorilla shit. Uh, with that, Diana, I will let you take the stage. Okay, thank you very much, Andrea. And I wanted to give a shout out to uh, you and Hazel and Pat and Johanna, all of whom organized this and all the other organizers, because it's a great way to bring us all together and to fill in a lot of gaps in the knowledge. I also want to give a, a, a thanks to Kim Cunningham, who's the one who got me starti started studying microbes in, in Lechuguilla Cave and also help get Penny Boston and I working together. And also to the SLIME team, the Subsurface Life and Mineral Environment, you're gonna get introduced to several of them as, as we talk. And, the, and I could not do this without the National Park Service. And that starts back with Dale and um, Stan was enormously helpful in the cave with several of the expeditions. And Aaron and, and Rod have also been really helpful as well as David Eck. And lastly, but not the least at all, is all the cave explorers who have helped out with the science, helped out with carrying things, getting samples. Everybody's been a wonderful team to work with. So we are going to start, once I convince my computer to advance, which it doesn't want to do. Any tips, Andrea, for uh, how to get the PowerPoint to advance? Can you just try hitting the right arrow on your keyboard? That is not working. And in fact, it won't go out of presentation mode. OK, can you click on the slide? Oh, there you go. So yeah. we're, we're out of the PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to share again. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, we're going to start with the macroscopic life. Yesterday, one of the people, a couple people mentioned they hadn't seen that many invertebrates. And so um, we're going to start with the very first study I did in Lechuguilla, um, which was looking at doing an inventory outside the cave around the entrance and also from the entrance to um, EY jun EF uh, Junction. And one of the main characters in this is Scythophilus longipes, which is the most cave adapted uh, cricket in, and they're actually camel crickets, which are not real crickets in North America. And we basically put out pitfall traps and then would go back 24 hours later to census who was in them. And you can see a map that was drawn by um, Jim Hardy way back in 1991 of where our traps were. So from the entrance down almost to the top of Apricot Pit. And what we found is that lots of invertebrates in the first couple hundred feet, and then it dropped off and completely dropped off after 2000. The other thing that we monitored was whether uh, what kinds of crickets there were, and also the presence of redines, diplurins, and spiders. A really intriguing thing is the highest peaks in here were for the juveniles, so you can, can see the seasonal variation. So here at month 12 and month 22, when there's lots of young, and then the most common organism was uh, the longipes, which you see down here. So um, 
Pat Cicero and uh, Gosha redid this study. They did a last study because we wanted to remove all of the flags that marked where this was. So all of those were removed in a repeat study in, in 2006. And I really appreciate all the work Pat Cicero has done over the years. So now we're going to go into four short uh, synopses of four of the studies that I and several of the SLIME team members have done over the last three decades. So we're going to start with human microbe contamination. There was quite a bit mentioned on this yesterday. Then on to the ferromanganese deposits or gorilla shit and looking at pool water diversity then. And then we're going to end with can Lechugia be, be an analog for what life might be like um, on another terrestrial body, extraterrestrial body. So starting with the human indicator, this is actually a project that we did early on in, and um, presented on in 2005. This is, I did it with Kathy Lavoie from SUNY Plattsburgh and two of my students, Amaka and Jessica. The funding came from the Charles A. and Anne Morrow Lindbergh Fund, who funds exploratory things in T&E Inc. So you can see in the upper left, this is Val helping me heat bacillus samples because we were going after just the higher temperature bacillus that cavers would bring in on their boots that would then survive because it's a spore former. And so we, we checked trail areas for this in camps and then looked for E. coli in the pea spots uh, at the camps, which were more numerous back at this time, and also swabbed various rocks for cavers slime over, like that one in the rift that you, that's a little tighter that you go around that you will get to come in contact with, and looked for Staphylococcus aureus, a common skin bacteria. And what we ended up finding out of this work was that there were higher numbers of human indicator bacteria found in areas where you had greater human impact, but we got the park to close the br a particular branch one at a time, so we wouldn't get killed by all the cavers who couldn't get access to the rest of the cave, and basically did a, a re-census and found that given some time without humans present, that um, the human indicator bacteria die off with the exception of the bacillus which remains in spore forms. So having established trails, camps, and, and peace spots can certainly limit the impact of the humans. It also has, a, has the ability to limit the amount of organic con, uh, carbon contamination, and that's absolutely critical to keep these from gaining a hold. My favorite study here is basically the ferromanganese deposits. And this is what I did for my PhD. In 1989, just as I was getting interested in Lechigia, I took a microbiology class with Cliff Dom that you'll see on the right there with Laura Crossy. And it was like being Alice in Wonderland and falling into Wonderland. I completely gave up invertebrates. And, and especially once I met Kim, started moving into doing microbial work instead. And uh, I was joined in this by Mike Spilde. When I started my PhD, I took a, um, a microscopy course with him. And I also took him hooked up with Penny Boston and we started this study. So you know a lot about ferromanganese deposits or corrosion residue. There was a, a model of how corrosive air can do this. And this is certainly possibly also responsible for some of the FMD um, formation. But what Mike and Penny and several others of us discovered is that, um, and Kim led the way on, on suggesting this, is that chemolithotrophic um, bacteria are important in this and also probably archaea. So um, just so you know, the ferromanganese deposits are more acidic than the punk rock. And this becomes important because <clears throat> the punk rock is probably formed as part of this process. 
So, and this is, for those of you who haven't really looked at the finer points on punk rock, if you look at the brown FMD right here, and then here, you can see how friable it looks, and you can actually stick your finger in this. And Harvey can probably correct me, but I think Carol Hill named it punk rock. <coughs> so, um, Mike and the rest of us developed a model looking at how the microbes would interact and do the development of the um, FMD. So the wall rock, and, and this was a great joy of working collaboratively, collaboratively across sciences. Because you'll see here that down in the bedrock, there is reduced manganese and reduced iron. That's really key because the microbes basically are, are mining the rock for this reduced form because when they oxidize it, they strip off electrons and that gives them energy. The result of that reaction is acid. So just think of like if you were to um, pee on the rock and, and your pee was really acidic, you would start dissolving some of the rock. And that's part of what happens. We actually find microbes down here in the punk rock as well as in the FMD. We, um, Mike also did a study looking at the, um, across the insoluble residue all the way up through the black uh, corrosion residues or FMD and found that there's a fourfold four fold magnitude increase in the amount of manganese from the bedrock to the FMD, something that is the microbes are needed for to accomplish that. Looking at them with scanning electron microscopy, which is Mike's specialty in which I took a class from him and learned about it. Um, you'll see here some of the manganese oxides sort of woven together in almost a felted pattern, iron oxides in sort of like basket-like formations. And then within the manganese oxides, and this is a sample from snowing, snowing passage in the void, you'll see these beads on a string. And this is something that Penny and I particularly delighted in finding. We now find these all over the world in cave samples, they're very common. And you're gonna look now at other microbes that we're finding. So besides the scanning electron microscopy, I did some acridine orange staining and looked at who I could see in the various deposits, both punk rock and FMD. And what you're seeing here are what are known as prosthecate bacteria. So here's the cell and here's the appendage that it has. Prosthecate bacteria are uh, two of the ones that we see here, hyphomicrobium, pedomicrobium, are both manganese oxidizers and they're also prosthecate bacteria. And so these could be some of the major players in the formation of the FMD. There are other organisms here that can oxidize either iron or manganese. And then an intriguing thing is the results that we got also detected quite a bit of nitrogen cyclers. So that's important because all organisms require nitrogen for life. And it turns out from studies we've done in Fort Stanton, we now know that in caves, uh, bacteria and archaea, the other domain of life, play a critical part in the nitrogen cycle. Here is an experiment that Penny Boston started in, in, uh, with Mike Spildy. So you, in here you see a um, Petri dish with or, organisms from the rainbow room inoculated into it. And they have reached the point in their growth where they're actually precipitating manganese oxides. And then what Mike did with these cultures is they first killed uh, one of them at the beginning. Then they let them grow over eight months and he analyzed the minerals present over that time. So here's a culture at three months that was not killed. By the way, they also killed one culture at one month and it developed no minerals at all. And at three months, this culture, which is still alive, 
it produced bucerite. And down here, this culture at eight months produced burnicite. So it was a very good evidence that the microorganisms can actually produce the manganese oxides. This is a quick look at some of the other organisms that are present. This is a family tree. It's a, called a phylogenetic tree. Think of it as your genealogy. What I want you to look at here is the red uh, labels, which are from um, Lechigia from two different areas down here also. Notice how apart they are from other things on this family tree. So one of the things we discovered, and I checked it a month ago, some of these have still not been characterized even down to the order of life. So they are very undescribed species of archaea. So this is a project we want to um, return to because there are some discoveries to be made here. So now we're going to turn, uh, turn to the cave pools. And this is looking both at Carlsbad Cavern and at Lechigia Cave. This is a study, um, Caitlin Reed, who's a PhD student in, the, in engineering, Leslie Malim, who is the pool finger queen that I've done a lot of work with over the years, and Era Winner, who's a former PhD student of mine. And that's Era in that picture by Kenneth. So the key points that I'm gonna present here are, we surveyed across 17 different pools and we asked the question, are isolated pools, there's only two that flow into another pool, uh, are isolated pools in the Guadalupe case similar or different? And even though they appear really clear, do they have microorganisms in them? And our analysis actually shows that each pool is, is fairly different even from another pool that a few years ago might have flowed into that pool. And I think it gives credence for it's really important to protect our pools. So in Lechigia, we took samples from all three branches. I would dearly love to have more samples, but that's for another day. And this is the results showed as a bar graph of what we found. This is the phylum level of bacteria. So you've heard quite a bit of talk probably over time about the actinobacteria, which give caves their musty odor. So you can see them in places. And, but what I want you to look at is especially in Lechigia Cave and Hell Below Cave, and to some extent in the New Mexico room and lower cave, how different the pools are from each other. And, um, and no two pools are exactly the same. This is the, uh, the same graph with red stars by where the nitrospirae, the phylum that contains nitrospira are. And you'll notice that there's a star on every graph. So they were widespread. So there's probably good indications of a lot of nitrogen cycling with these microorganisms. So they appear to be quite key. So across these 17 different pool communities, it appears that our hypothesis that each pool is somewhat unique is, uh, is supported. Um, and it supports the idea that when you're analyzing uh, samples, you should not group everything together. Um, our future studies, we want to expand the sampling and expand the sequencing and also look at the contribution of, of geochemistry to this. And then one last quick study is a study done by um, Crystal Charlie, a undergrad in my lab at the time, who's now in grad school elsewhere, and she basically took cultures that Penny had done a Mars simulation experiment on. The cultures had come from caves, various caves here in, in, in Arizona, a mine, and also the Gypsum Flats. And she basically subcultured them to get individual cultures to sequence and to compare to a group of cultures that Arrow Winter got in um, Lake of the, above Lake of the White Roses and I think the Ruby Chamber and to see if this could be a good analog. And 
basically we discovered the same group. So you'll notice the labels are the same across the bottom, but the amounts of them present is very different. And so um, the Mars survivors are the ones that actually survive, survive the conditions that are actually on Mars, whereas and the Lechigia ones are out of a dark environment. So there is some overlap, but at the genus level, not all that overlap. So key findings from these various studies, um, the invertebrates are only present in the first 2000 feet. It's critical to minimize human carbon enrichment and FMDs result from biomineralization and cave pools have diverse communities and oligotrophic caves can guide our search for extraterrestrial life. One coming attraction in a, in a coming up issue of Journal and Cave Car Studies is another study out of Lechigia that you can look for. And I'd just like to dedicate this talk to Bob Beecher and who died this at the end of this June from complications of open heart surgery. He was an immense help, both he and Debbie in both Lechigia and other cave studies and over like three decades. So with that, I will take questions and thank you very much for your attention. Hey Diana, thanks for an excellent talk. Um, one of the things you had mentioned um, besides being influenced by um, Cliff Down, um, getting you interested in microbiology, but you said Kim Cunningham had his influence and you've mentioned him several times. Do you have a story to tell about him? Um, not so much him, although the way that he drew me in, actually Kim was just great. He called up and said, you need to do this. <laughs> And then he made things to get Penny and I together. Um, Kim was never shy about that and was just, this needs lots of exploration and you can do the sequencing. So not with that one. I have plenty of other stories from La Chiguilla, <laughs> but not, not some, I never actually got to cave with Kim. Um, so I, when I first met you, you were the crooked lady. And now yep. <laughs> And now you've moved on to another one of those crazy people that see things that nobody else sees um, and going from underground to outer space. Um, did you ever imagine that that was going to happen? No, actually, I didn't. I've actually been caving since 1966. Some of you may know Bill Jones from uh, West Virginia, Virginia, and he took me on my first cave trip, which involved uh, falling in a, in a uh, pool in a stream over my head and thinking, this is really fun. So, um, but no, I never envisioned, I always wanted to do biology, but I never even thought about microbiology until I, and actually Cliff gave me a small, um, small vacutainers and he said, get some samples out of the pools in La Chiguilla. And those pools had the most amazing organisms in them. Turns out like Celebaria and some of the prosecate bacteria, but you could see those in the pool. So next time you take a drink out of the pool, guys, just think about one of those like um, cells with the long extensions going down your throat. <laughs> Thanks. Um, questions are starting to roll in now. So we have one from Anna Stewart in South Korea. She um, talks about cave snails feeding on cave walls. Do you also see cave creatures feeding on cave microbes? Actually, that's a really interesting question. We did a study at El Mont Pais in the lava caves there, and you actually, there's a vacuum for collecting insects, and we did it on, on microbial mats and on the algal mats, and there were no critters on the algal, but there were, uh, I'm sorry, they were all on the algal and not on the, on the microbial mat. However, we're also working in Lava Beds National Monument and in the SEMs that Mike Spildy and I are doing, we find like dead mites and all kinds of insect parts. So they're there. Nice. Uh, so yes, they probably are. Cool. 
There's a question about how long did it take for the bacteria related to humans to disperse from the camps once they were closed? So in the month, and, and we didn't go back for a month, but in one month, they were, all, they were mostly gone. Wow, that's good. Um, next question is, have you compared microbiology with samples from older parts of the earth like South Africa? have not done South Africa, but we have done sampling in Australia, Iceland, the Azores, and Mexico, and various areas in the U.S., and I feel like I'm missing one of the countries. Um, but yeah, we've done multiple. Mainly, we've been comparing it across lava cave microbial communities. Um, and Jenny Hathaway did a paper in 2014 that showed that like Hawaii and the Azores are um, different microbiologically, but they also have some commonality. So um, yeah, that we actually need to do a whole lot more of that because it's amazing to see how the tree of life has changed over the last, oh, I don't know, Hazel will chime in here, over the last um, five years. So the tree of life for the archaea, that other domain from bacteria, is really different now. People have actually identified um, several of the unknown sequences, and, and you can just see a whole lot more. And the amount that we're finding that nitrogen cycling is so key in caves. Um, means that we need to do a lot more biogeochemical cycling studies too. Cool. Did you want to add something to that? Or? All right, so Michael Taylor asks about what are the general similarities between lech microbes and those in VLUs, assuming there are any. Those I haven't actually compared. We have compared Parashant National Monument and uh, Via Luz and Fort Stanton Cave in New Mexico. And the first analysis we did, which sort of clusters samples by similarity, showed they were all three different. Cool. Um, so they probably are fairly different um, in that, which is actually kind of fun to do. But you have to compare them in different ways to really have a good assessment of that. There's a whole lot more to be done if anybody's really interested. Um, you know, there aren't that many of us, Hazel and, and Annette and Penny and I and a, and a few others. And Spain is getting really active. But there's a lot to be done. All right. Here's a, one last question. Um, to what extent do microbial organisms perhaps those that are not chemiotrophs, fit into the scheme of troglophytes, troglozines, and troglophiles? Oh, that's a great question. And actually, we wrote a grant a few years ago to try to explore um, whether you could actually classify cave microbes as, you know, more adapted or less adapted, which I think you can, because there are a lot of times when I'm doing a study, I will do different media to try to target really low nutrient ones versus ones that, that um, are different. And, and so, um, so there's, we don't know, but I think there is definitely a possibility that there are different groups of organisms in the cave. Awesome. Thanks very much, Diana. That was an excellent presentation. And I'll turn this over to Andrea. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. And thanks, Diana, for a wonderful presentation.